From CAFE, welcome to Stay Tuned. I'm Preet Bharara. This is the first time Trump cannot really spin his own alternative facts and version of events. Pretty soon, unfortunately, we're going to know people who've lost jobs, who've been affected economically, who've gotten the virus. And that's going to fly in the face of him saying, uh, everything's fine. That's David Pluff. He's the author of A Citizen's Guide to Beating Donald Trump, a pragmatic handbook for voters getting involved in the 2020 election. Pluff also hosts the Campaign HQ podcast, where he breaks down the latest on the presidential race with campaign managers and political insiders who are closest to the action. And Pluff knows plenty about campaigns. He managed Barack Obama's 2008 presidential run, served as a senior advisor to the president during his 2012 re-election, and advised countless candidates as a partner at a political consulting firm founded by his close collaborator, David Axelrod. We'll talk about Joe Biden's comeback, the political impact of the coronavirus, and how Pluff believes Democrats can defeat President Trump in November. That's coming up. Stay tuned. Hey folks, you've heard me talk about Cafe Insider, and maybe you've listened to samples of it in this feed. It's a subscription service that helps members make sense of law and politics. And we want to make sure everyone gets an opportunity to participate, which includes students, who are eligible for 65% off an annual membership, plus the first two weeks free. No time like the present to give a student in your life, or if you're a student listening, give yourself the gift of understanding. Head to cafe.com slash student. That's cafe.com slash student. Hi, Preet. This is Adam from Denver. Uh, my question is about the actions or really the inaction of the House following the closure of the impeachment proceedings. Uh, they don't seem to be following up on any of the potential impeachment witnesses, such as John Bolton, but they also don't seem to be investigating anything else, including Bill Barr's political interference at the DOJ. They haven't sought to hear from any of the prosecutors who resigned from the Roger Stone case. And they also don't seem to be interested in holding any hearings about the botched response to the coronavirus outbreak uh, or any of the other longstanding targets for investigation, such as abuse of office and uh, personal enrichment uh, by Trump's family. And so I was wondering if uh, you had any thoughts about this, about this lack of interest in pursuing their investigative functions. Uh, thanks. I love your show. I love your choice of guests. Please keep the hits coming. Hey, Adam, thanks for your question. You know, there are a lot of things going on, and there are a lot of different issues that the House could be pursuing. One thing I think that's going on is that there's an overwhelming amount of other news. The primaries, that rough contest taking place week after week of primaries and caucuses. You also have the coronavirus, which is a very serious problem in the country. That's taking up a lot of oxygen also. It is true, however, that I have also not seen any push to get John Bolton's testimony. We hear from time to time something about the delay of his book, but to date, neither the House nor the Senate has subpoenaed John Bolton. That is a little bit odd. The House has asked for the testimony of the four Roger Stone prosecutors who withdrew from the case, but no word yet on whether that's going to take place. Another thing that's going on that we've talked about previously on the show is a legal setback the House has suffered in trying to obtain testimony from former government officials. The D.C. Court of Appeals, as we've discussed, basically said that they're not going to get involved in the effort to force or compel former White House counsel Don McGahn to testify. And maybe that part of this is House Democrats are trying to figure out the most effective way forward. As for the coronavirus and oversight of that response, which I think has been inadequate, as we speak, as I'm recording this podcast on the morning of Wednesday, March 11th, there is, in fact, a House Oversight and Reform Committee hearing that includes, among other people, Dr. Anthony Fauci. There's some argument about whether or not that hearing is going to go as long as the chair, Carolyn Maloney, wants it to go. But that is happening. And I expect you're going to see a lot of oversight effort and attention to the coronavirus response. One more thing to look for, which may be interesting, is that to the extent there's going to be additional action with respect to Burisma and Hunter Biden in the wake of Ukraine and in the wake of Joe Biden looking like he might be the nominee for the Democrats, there might be a countermeasure that's been discussed by, among other people, Michael Bloomberg and his advisors. And that is an effort to play, I guess, tit for tat. If Republicans and Trump supporters are going to investigate Joe Biden's son, then it's possible Democrats in the House may choose to investigate Donald Trump's children and financial dealings and benefits they may have gotten by virtue of their relationship to the president. So there's not a lot of time between now and the election, 
And my guess is that Democrats want to be careful and picky and selective in what they choose to pursue. But you can see one or both of those things happen, coronavirus and maybe some response to what the Republicans are doing on Burisma. This next question comes in an email from Nate, who says, Hi, Preet. Love the pod. You're an invaluable voice of reason. I was surprised to hear you refer to Lee Harvey Oswald as the alleged assassin of JFK. Correct me if I'm wrong, but your use of the word alleged seemed deliberate. Do you believe in any of the JFK assassination conspiracy theories? Were you respecting the presumption of innocence? Thanks. So yes, Nate, it's true. Last week when I was having the conversation about deepfakes with Professor Fareed, we were discussing a photograph of Lee Harvey Oswald, and in reference to him, I called him the alleged assassin. No, I do not believe in the conspiracy theories. I do believe that Lee Harvey Oswald is the person who assassinated JFK. I will note, though, that he was murdered before he had the ability to be tried in a court of law. And I guess my habitual training as a lawyer and former U.S. attorney is in that circumstance to use the word alleged. This question comes from Twitter user Paulo Votes Blue, who says, Hashtag AskPreet, tell us how you really feel. Damn, this thread is cathartic. Paulo appears to be referring to a Twitter thread that I posted, and it's very rare that I post threads of any kind. I like to keep my tweets to a minimum in terms of length. But I posted one on Saturday night. The first tweet in the thread was, Donald Trump is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on America. Now, a bunch of folks have asked me, including members of my family, why those tweets? Why then? And I'll tell you, you know, I try to remain calm and measured, and I generally am. But there are moments when you do feel overwhelmed by the ridiculousness of the administration, the threats that are coming fast and furious, whether they're economic or health-related or political or damaging to the rule of law. And as I was sitting in front of the television on Sunday evening and hearing the reports about the bottom falling out of the market in the coming days and hearing more and more about the unpreparedness of the administration to respond to the coronavirus and hearing about my own boy's high school closing suddenly because there was a positive case in the middle school in the school district that I live in, I thought back to what the initial response of Donald Trump was. And it was this. On national television, Donald Trump referred to the coronavirus as a democratic hoax. He uses the word hoax to disguise his own ineptitude, to attack his enemies, to put other people down. And it occurred to me that that could be turned on its head because the hoax actually emanates from the White House. So let me end by addressing a bit of news that broke literally as I was walking into the studio this Wednesday morning, March 11th. And that is Harvey Weinstein has finally been sentenced. And there had been some speculation about what the sentence would be. Ann Milgram and I discussed it on the Cafe Insider podcast. Ann has a lot of experience with these kinds of cases. She was a Manhattan ADA herself. And in our discussion, we thought that he might receive something like six to nine years. Recall that he was convicted on two of five counts with which he was charged by the Manhattan DA's office. And the two counts on which he was convicted were the less serious ones of the five. Based on the law in New York, Weinstein could have gotten as little as five years on the two convictions. But in this case, the judge, James Burke, has imposed a sentence of 23 years on Harvey Weinstein. He imposed 20 years on the count of criminal sexual assault of Miriam Haley and another three years consecutively for rape in the third degree of Jessica Mann. I think a lot of factors probably went into the decision to impose such a high sentence. I think the judge was trying to achieve a deterrent effect. I think the judge was trying to send a message. I think the judge was not impressed by the lack of remorse shown by Harvey Weinstein. And I think this is a very important milestone in the treatment of these kinds of cases. And by the way, I think credit is due to a lot of different folks, not just the prosecutor's office, for this conviction and hefty sentence. Credit goes to the victims who came forward under very difficult circumstances after having been harassed and abused and careers destroyed, nonetheless came forward and made this kind of conviction possible. Credit also goes to the free press that often gets attacked by the president and by others. In particular, Megan Toohey, Jody Cantor of the New York Times, and Ronan Farrow of The New Yorker, who we've had on the show. And while the 23-year sentence is significant, we have to put it in perspective. Here's a statement released by The Silence Breakers, a group of people who were victimized by Harvey Weinstein. And they write, Harvey Weinstein's legacy will always be that he's a convicted rapist. He is going to jail, but no amount of jail time will repair the lives he ruined, the careers he destroyed, or the damage he has caused. That's true. And one more thing. While justice may have been done in this case, it's not finished because Harvey Weinstein still faces charges in California. And of course, Harvey Weinstein is just one person. We'll know whether these efforts are succeeding 
when more people like Harvey Weinstein are brought to the bar of justice, convicted, and sentenced. It's time for a short break. Stay tuned. Everyone wants to keep their home and family safe, whether it's from a break in, a fire, flooding, or a medical emergency. Simply Safe Home Security delivers award winning 24 7 protection. With Simply Safe, you don't just get an arsenal of cameras and sensors, you get the best professional monitors in the business. They've got your back day and night, ready to send emergency responders when you need them most straight to your door. My experience with Simply Safe has been great from the easy setup to the high quality equipment to the clear camera footage. You can set Simply Safe up yourself in about 30 minutes. It's super easy. Then Simply Safe's professionals take over, monitoring your home 24/7 and ready to send help the moment there's an alarm. Plus there's no long-term contract, no hidden fees or installation costs. Right now, our listeners get a free home security camera when you purchase a Simply Safe system at simplysafe.com/preet. You also get a 60-day risk-free trial, so there's nothing to lose. Visit simplysafe.com slash preet for your free security camera today. That's simplysafe.com slash preet. After three years away, Politically Reactive is back with new episodes. And unfortunately, there's a lot to talk about. Hosted by W. Kamau Bell of CNN's United Shades of America and Hari Kondabolu, writer and star of The Problem with Apu, Politically Reactive is an essential guide to the wave after wave of unprecedented events and the madness of American politics. Every week, Kamal and Hari talk with the creators, thinkers, and leaders doing the work to defend and reinvent our democracy. Plus, they bring you into their ongoing conversations as friends and fathers trying to make sense of the headlines. With equal parts laughter and outrage, Kamal and Hari want you to be appalled but never discouraged. Politically Reactive will help you find ways to take action and feel your power. Listen and subscribe to Politically Reactive on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. My guest this week is David Pluff. He's a political consultant who managed Barack Obama's 2008 presidential campaign. Last week, he published A Citizen's Guide to Beating Donald Trump, a collection of straightforward strategies for getting out the vote this year. He joins me to talk about his memories of the contentious 2008 primary battle between Obama and Hillary Clinton, his hopes for Democratic Party unity, and the uncertain future of primaries and caucuses. We also talk through President Trump's handling of the coronavirus and reflect on the candidacies of the presidential candidates who have dropped out in recent weeks. That's coming up. Stay tuned. David Pluff, thank you for being on the show. Pre, it's great to be with you. So you have a book, a new book called A Citizen's Guide to Beating Donald Trump. Everyone should carry one of these. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to we're going to get to this and some of your prescriptions in it in a moment, but I should state for the audience, we are recording uh, a little after 2 p.m. on Monday, March 9th, and all hell seems to be breaking loose. There's a proliferation of coronavirus cases. Schools are closing. Uh, universities are saying they're not going to have face-to-face teaching. We're getting lots of stories of more people contracting uh, the coronavirus because there's now testing seemingly for the first time on any kind of scale. And on top of everything else, the bottom of the stock market seems to be falling um, out. This morning, after I think four or five minutes of trading, the New York Stock Exchange halted trading based on protocols because the S&P 500 dropped a full 7% just within minutes. So let me ask you first, uh, David, given your past on the Obama campaign, how much does the last few days feel like the fall of 2008, when the financial crisis was upon us. Is that, is that a fair comparison or not? Well, we didn't have the physical health component, but yeah, the uncertainty, uh, every day seeming worse than the last, you know, people really beginning to get concerned about, you know, their jobs and savings. So it does. I mean, you know, we've had plenty of challenges in this country in the intervening 12 years. Um, but that's a long time historically to go from certainly, you know, downturn to downturn if that's where we're headed. But, yeah, I, I think it does have a familiar feel. Can you describe for us what was that like? I remember I was working in the Senate at the time. So, you know, we were watching it sort of play by play. There was, I think, a moment where John McCain 
did he suspend his campaign in September? He did. 2008, yeah. Yeah. You guys did so not. So that, we did not. And, and, you know, folks forget, no, that was a relatively close race deep into the election. And- 